당신으로부터 직접 자기 소개를 듣는 시간을 오래 기다려왔다. 아무튼 대단히 먼저 듣는다. 제사네. 저 이거 저 신이 저 제사하자. 얼마나 시간 대답 시간 뭐 편하게 살고 있어요. 네네. 좀 간이 근데 저 대단 장소. 아, 我是唐凤。 天才的电脑工程师呃系列开课呃最年轻的政务委员这种有很多些称案例对自己你怎么样的想法你本人对自己你是本什么样的人程序员程序员我还想再补充一下张明有点短一些 在你们团队来之前 BBC Click 的团队也刚来过也是连续的跟拍那唯一的这个他们的要求跟你们一样就是我每天要穿一样的衣服跟一样的T恤这样子才比较联系嘛才能够连在一起但是因为我这件T恤我自己就有个实践作用所以这是没
uh, is too odd, like e-sport. E-sport is not quite like a sport, but it's not quite like a culture either. It's not quite like a economy. It's some combination of the three. So I have to work with the ministries of culture, of economic development, also with education to make sure that e-sport have a good definition here in Taiwan. It could be legally recognized that athletes participating in the e-sport. And so that gives rise to the need for a horizontal ministry because each vertical ministry has no existing way to deal with such an emergent digital phenomenon. That means your coverage is getting wider and wider. Yes. So theoretically, all 32 ministries can have people in my office to work in a horizontal way and work in a radically transparent way. In practice, of course, not all ministries have set people. Like the Minister of Defense did not send anyone. Uh, maybe they're still getting used to radical transparency. So, but I'm not forcing anyone because I'm an anarchist. I'm not forcing the Minister of Defense to do things my way. But like the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, after seeing my way of working for a year, decided to send people to my office. So this is, as you said, getting larger and larger gradually. But it's always just one person from each ministry at a time. How is it to work in the government as an artist? I work with the government, right? I don't work for the government. So we have government on one side and the social movement on the other side. And I'm like in the Lagrange point, like the point between the moon and the earth, right? Between the two different uh, forces. Uh, or sometimes I mean the uh, second Lagrange point is like a triangle uh, helping the two sides to talk to one another without me being the mediator or translator. So usually I'm in one of the two positions. Either they don't trust each other and I convince the government to trust me more, or they already trust each other, then I facilitate uh, new ways so that people don't repeat each other's work unnecessarily. <laughs> 政府的想法,对政府的结构。So governance is, of course, uh, always needed. Like in internet governance, even in Wikipedia, we all have governance systems, but they're voluntary, because obviously Wikipedia cannot use coercion or use violence <laughs> to convince everybody to edit Wikipedia. It doesn't work like this. But nevertheless, it is a governance mechanism, and it has its own legitimacy theory, its own way of appeals, like the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, like the ICANN that allocates dot Amazon to uh, you know Amazon Company or Amazon Rainforest. But that are political questions, and these are governance decisions. It's just operating outside the traditional West Valley sovereign state framework. So I think governance mechanism is always needed. The more collaborative it is, the more relevant it will be to the people. So if traditional governments don't embrace the anarchist value of voluntary association, real-time, ad hocacy, then they may be irrelevant or they may be feeling as too old, too archaic for the people. But if they can reinvent themselves to rely less on top-down power, but more on network making power, then it can still be relevant. So there could be a governance mechanism that is not built on coercion. And when it's entirely not built on coercion or violence, it is an anarchist uh, governance mechanism. Yes, so uh, I started working as a kind of reverse mentor or understudy of a previous minister, uh, also a result minister, Jacqueline Tsai. And Jacqueline Tsai uh, started this partnership because she went to a Gov Zero social movement hackathon and she brings with her a topic saying we want to build V Taiwan, a mechanism for people who are teleworking, who are startups setting the Cayman Island, and so on. These people don't have a union, they don't have an association, but they are at the cutting edge. So we want to make sure that our lawmaking is crowdsourced, getting the ideas right from the very start. And so I helped uh, getting a team, building that platform, and operating that platform, and learning facilitation techniques. 
So for a year and a half or so, I participated as a kind of volunteer, a understudy to a previous minister. And once uh, Dr. Tang won the election uh, with an open government as well as broad as human rights campaign, um, the premier at the time, Ling Chen, asked me to find a kind of counterpart to Jack and Tsai in the new government. So I asked around my friends in the startup sector, in the so, uh, social innovation sector, and so on, but nobody wanted to be a minister. Uh, so uh, I'm like, okay, why, why do I try it myself, right? And I told uh, Premier Lin Chen uh, that uh, I have three conditions joining a uh, volunteer association I would before to take a month that we already talked about, radical transparency, all the meetings that I chair, all the meetings with uh, journalists or with lobbyists, I have to uh, open the entire report to the public, and also location independence. I can tour around Taiwan, and I still am working. Uh, I don't have to go to the office uh, every day. And he uh, agreed to those three conditions. By the way, I didn't invent those uh, conditions. Those were crowdsourced also. So when he asked me to become minister in 2016, in August, I wrote a public ask me anything for him for a month to get people's imagination of my positions together. And that formed the condition. And I used that condition to have a negotiation with the premier. So it could be said that my mandate is also a process. In the administration, we work on topics not owned by any single ministry. So if the Ministry of Education says, oh, e-sport, it is just a sport. So we will own this matter and we will treat it exactly like physical education. Then horizontal minister will have no say in this because it's entirely a Ministry of Education matter. But at that time, when I joined the cabinet, the Minister of Education was saying it's not physical education, it doesn't move the, the body that much, it's mostly your uh, arm and fingers. And so it's not physical education, and we think that this is not a Minister of Education business. Uh, when they say that, they are like, oh, maybe the Minister of Economy want to consider that. Economy is like, uh, oh no, we supervise uh, making software and hardware and equipments, but the athletes or the players, this is not our business. Uh, you need to talk to the Ministry of Culture. Uh, and Ministry of Culture says, uh, we support the players of Go, uh, right, because it's a traditional culture. But, uh, you know, LOL is not a traditional culture, so we cannot support it. And uh, when uh, situations like this happen, then it becomes my mandate to find a philosophical convergence between the different positions in the uh, different ministries. So, in short, any cross ministries issue is horizontal ministries uh, power. But if any issue is already defined by law or by regulation, only by one single ministry, then usually they don't need a horizontal minister to do that. Mm -hmm.开放政府的问题so open government is a way for the government to trust the people more. And sometimes the people will trust back. This is the core of open government. In implementation, it means transparency, making sure that everything that we do is uh, seen by the public in real time. If we only publish annually what we did, then nobody feels that we're relevant. But if, as we carry on the budget, carry on the regulatory policy making as the one, we make all the proceedings, not just the end result, transparent, uh, also as machine readable data, then people feel much more relevant that our work is can be combined into remixes, into new applications that people can make sense of. For example, uh, the national budget used to be a very thick book, and in PDF it's like 500 uh, pages. Nobody has the time 
to read through the 500 pages. But if the government, as we do now, publish the entire budget data, procurement data, as well as auditing data, it has structured data, then uh, computer programmers can write them into an interactive form that you can just type in the area you care about or the place you live in. And then it can drill down to that particular place, enabling you to view at a glance what are the government projects pertinent to your locality or to your uh, county or to your municipality. So that is transparent. The second thing is participation. Once people understand what policymaking is about, then people may have ideas. If you don't give them uh, transparent information, they may still have ideas, but these are disconnected with policy making. So after transparency, there should be ways for people to start participate and give their ideas through e-petition, through real-time dialogue, through presidential hackathon, all sorts of different ways to have the public service incorporate the best ideas from the citizens, so that's participation. The third is called accountability. Once they've provided their ideas, we have to explain why some ideas work. Why some does it? If it works, we have to explain how soon are we going to make it happen or why not. And once we committed to make it happen, we have also to explain what kind of implementation details do we run into, what kind of help do we want from the citizens to make it uh, well implemented. So that's accountability, the ability to explain. And finally, it's inclusion. Using technologies, we can bring people who are not living in Taipei, who don't usually watch uh, the parliament live streams, who have no idea what's uh, going on with the national government, closer with the policy making. For example, I can tour to where they are, and with me, I bring all the central government with me. And so the local people can just bring a local issue, but every municipality can learn that this local issue is a symptom of a larger structural issue. Uh, case in point, the previous social innovation tour I bring uh, with the uh, central government's uh, national um, railroad uh, company. And they met uh, virtually with a person uh, that uh, brings his uh, son with a autist uh, spectrum. And uh, they were taking the rails. Uh, but because they look uh, not like handicapped people, but bought the handicap uh, ticket, they were uh, just specifically asked by the uh, service people to show their ticket, uh, and they feel that it's uh, a kind of uh, discriminating behavior. In high-speed rails, uh, usually when they decide to do that, they check the ticket for everybody sitting nearby. But in uh, Taiwan uh, rails, they used to uh, just check that specific person. So it feels like uh, discriminating. And, and so they have a, a petition based on the CRPD that Taiwan is a signatory of. And so if it's just by writing, then it's very easy to grow mistrust of each other. But after hearing their story for the completely the first time, um, then the Taiwan uh, National Rails decided that they have to change their ways. And they apologized and bowed uh, on the screen. And uh, we discussed a very fruitful way going forward. And this is what we call inclusion. So usually, uh, they had to find a member of the parliament or a prominent journalist uh, to speak as an advocate for their story. But now, they can just use this kind of inclusive uh, setting and just speak their mind. But we make sure technology amplifies their voice and also gets them the response that they need. So including more people that were not possible to participate in democracy is the fourth pillar of open government. So transparency, uh, let me even know what we're doing, participation as people's ideas, accountability, making sure their ideas can be explained whether it works, and inclusion, including more people in the process, is open government. What is CIP? CRPD. CRPD. Yeah, so uh, it is a uh, international um, uh, agreement uh, um, uh, treating people with disabilities, giving them equal rights. So, social innovation. So, if uh, open government is the government making itself available to citizens, social innovation is not government initiated. It could be anyone who think of an idea, like the Wild Web or 
Bitcoin. Um, it's an idea that is stronger the more people join. And when more people join, it provides a public benefit to everybody. So anything that can be participated by anybody to the benefit of the entire community is a social innovation. So open government, you could say that it is a way to facilitate social innovation with the data and the information from the government. But it must not control social innovation because social innovation is forming in the social sector. If the government wants to build and control the wild web, we won't have the wild web anymore. So social innovations like wild web need to grow in a cross-sectoral partnership. And the government must support but not own social innovation. Whereas for open government, of course we own, but we want everybody's support. <laughs> Well, just as in Korea, if you want something to be supported by all ministries, instead of convincing ministries one by one, it's often easier to have an office in the presidential office and say this is the presidential promise, right? It's the same in Korea as it's in Taiwan. So for example, the presidential hackathon uh, is a three months process that is uh, mandated by the president to say that we're asking the society to bring any idea forward and to build a cross-sectoral team. So there's a hundred or so teams every year and it's voted by popular voting but we use a social innovation in our voting. It's called quadratic voting, or QV. And QV is just uh, implemented this year. Taiwan is the first administrative body to use QV in public metrics. And QV means anyone going to our website in Presidential Hackathon receives 99 points, and they see 100 or so projects. They can vote one point on each project they like that gives 99 projects one point. But if they really like one uh, project in particular, they can give them more votes. But two votes is going to cost four votes. Three votes is nine votes. Four votes, 16 points. So it's quadratic. That's the name. So if you have 99 points and you have a uh, case you really like, you can still only vote nine points. And that gives you still 18 points left that you cannot vote the tenth vote anymore. And so you have to find something else and vote four points, but you still have two left. So you have to find two other projects. And by that time, probably saw, oh, maybe this really is more interesting than the original one that I you know, uh, agreed with. So I'll just take some votes back and put it there. So it is a way to make sure that every vote uh, has the same marginal utility and the marginal cost. So the cost for each new vote is the same as its new impact. Okay. And so this is a uh, voting method that uh, makes the old paradox, so-called Eros paradox, uh, go away because it can fairly represent the true preference uh, of the voter. So after QV, we select 20 teams this year, and they each uh, are coached uh, by myself and by many other experts into what we call trilingual teams. So no matter whether they start in the private sector, social sector, or the public sector, they must, in each team, have at least one public servant, one technological expert, and one domain expert. So usually from different sectors. And the reason why is that we want to make sure that their ideas are working for the benefit of all the sectors, not just for one benefit, uh, one stakeholder to the sacrifice of the other uh, stakeholders. So they have some really, really good ideas. For example, this year, uh, one of the five we need uh, uses machine learning and the public uh, company's declaration data and the uh, uh, judgments from the court to detect fraudulent loans by companies with the intention to deceive the bank. But using just machine learning and public information, they were able to predict what uh, company will be liable for such a kind of illicit money flow in the next month. So it's very, very useful. 
for uh, justice and also for investigation for financial stability and so on. But the proposal, only after they won the trophy, let everybody know that he's actually a public servant working in the tax bureau. Because he's a low level uh, public servant, it's very difficult for them to get a buy in from his uh, superiors because they need data from all the different ministries. But if he participates in presidential hacking, it doesn't work. There is no risk. It's just some weekend effort. But if it does work, then the president gives him a trophy. The trophy is no money. We cannot give public service money. But it is a projector. If you turn it on, it projects the president herself giving the trophy to you. And so if their um, director general doesn't like the idea, they can just summon the president. And the director general will have to agree on his idea. Because the presidential promise that the five ideas incubated in the past three months we will do whatever it takes to make it part of public service by the next year. And so this is a uh, democratic innovation. Basically, anyone can propose something to become part of public service just by making a prototype and convincing people to vote for them online and also showing them the prototype. So then, so then, I Digital 这个行业是没有办法实现的那台湾什么样的这样事情的出现它比较好奇这些什么的背景 So I think accountability is often overlooked in the four pillars of open government but accountability I would argue is the most important of the four Accountability means, for example, in my talk yesterday I talked about how we have a gender dashboard that all the government projects all the draft bills prepared by any ministry need to file a gender impact assessment uh, survey. And once they file that, independent civil society leaders also review them. So they must pass also social sectors uh, examination before the budget can be allocated or the draft bill can be presented to the parliament. And we have run this for 12 years. So after 12 years, each new policy even if it seems like a labor policy or fiscal policy or whatever policy, all the public servants involved learn to consider gender impact, even in the places that they have no idea would affect. And also, all the measurements they file in those in, in, uh, impact assessment reports, they will continue to be monitored by our statistics uh, bureau and other uh, civil society uh, entities. And so the end result is that we watch more and more. It's not just the top level, like we have almost 40% uh, women in our national parliament. But that's something every country measures. But we also measure um, in the, all the senior high school and high school, the percentage of women as principals, uh, as director generals in different positions and so on. So it's an extremely accountable system that all the policy must explain why it makes the gender imbalanced, or how does it help to make gender balanced, and we all have numbers to prove that. And so this theory of change, after running for 12 years, prepares the entire public service for gender mainstream and in extension for marriage equality. <laughs> So the name is uh, my office. Right? My office is called Public Digital Innovation Space. So public means that everything that we do is open source and open data. I'm working for the public, not for the government. So any government, from Reykjavik to actual Barcelona, to Madrid, <laughs> to uh, Toronto, they have all used our contributions. And in turn, we also have used the tools and processes that have been designed. And so this international network 
for the global public, not just for a country's public, uh, is the first word in my office's name. And the second word is digital. It means that whenever we make a work, we make it disseminated. Dissem whenever we make our work, we make it possible for it to be disseminated across the world with no degradation. If we make a physical sculpture, if you tour it around the earth, of course it will be degraded uh, and you can only exhibit at uh, one place at a time. But because it's digital, you can make perfect copies every time. And the perfect copies then become blueprints for other governments uh, and jurisdictions to add to it, what we call forking. We're developing to a direction, they may develop it in another direction, they may fork this idea. So we have Gov Zero Italy, for example, forking from the Taiwanese civic movement, Gov Zero. And there's people in Canada and US and so on, all taking the same basic idea, but forking very differently. And the digital also means that all the forks can also be merged. If they have a contribution to a system that we're developing, for example, Canada contributed uh, bilingual support for the POLIS system. So uh, in Canada, of course, if you type in French or in English on the federal level, it's the same status. So they have to do bilingual translation. But then it then gets used by the US government uh, in Taiwan so that tomorrow I will uh, go on a workshop to explain the uh, result of two months of digital dialogue of what people think are the best idea to further the trade and commercial relationship between US and Taiwan. And the ability of typing in uh, Mandarin and English is uh, basically thanks to the Canadian government's contribution. So digital means that we can experiment, but we can also learn from each other very easily. And innovation simply means that the people in the ministries or in the civil society or as today in the private sector, they talk to me if they want something new. If they uh, already is very satisfied with the status quo, well, of course they won't reach out to me. And what I'm doing essentially is giving a space or a sandbox for new ideas to fail. If it fails, it's my fault. It's not the public service's fault. And so their ideas can be tried uh, often in the public, but they don't have the risk of losing face or their superiors won't have the chance of losing face. So by absorbing all the risk, uh, innovation is easier to happen in the public sector. And finally, we call ourselves a space instead of an office because we have both physical spaces, such as the social innovation lab that you're on, um, also the basement that is very much worth uh, touring, but also we have spaces in the central administration office and also on the third floor of the central administration. And we also have a lot of online spaces. So in any of those spaces, if you're in a space, you're part of peace. And so just by talking to me now, you're contributing to our YouTube channel <laughs> under Creative Commons so that everybody can remix the video of ours and make it into like, different uses. So just by getting into the space, uh, agreeing to contribute to the Commons, it grows the connection of the networks that we reach. Of course, since you're a professional journalist, we will embargo the video, so you publish first, and then we publish. Of course, of course. Yeah, because we're not really a, a media business, right? <laughs> uh, but, but then this provides not just historians, but also subsequent journalists can refer back to this conversation and develop their questions further. <laughs> So uh, in policy making, often when we ask people's ideas, 
they provide an idea. But they provide that idea because they feel dissatisfied of something. Right? So if they say, oh, I want uh, Taiwan to change the time zone to plus nine, the same as Korea, that's an actual petition that happened. So it's an it's a idea. But why? Why would somebody say, I want our time zone to be the same as Korea? Um, then it must have some feeling behind it. But if we only look at the petition, that's the idea level, we also have people who feel differently. Like there's 8,000 people also who petition saying Taiwan should stay in the same time zone, in the plus 8, and not the same as Japan or something like that. And so they have, it seems like, opposing ideas, but maybe they have the same feelings. So our design is to make sure that they can discover each other's feelings by reflecting on um, why are, am I proposing this idea, um, sharing what I feel about my idea. We can facilitate people into a space that encourages people to resonate, that is to say agree or disagree with each other's ideas, but not their statements. In such spaces, we don't have a reply button. If you have a reply button, you can argue on one thing forever and consume everybody's attention. But if you don't have a reply button, imagine if the Facebook only have a like button or upload and download like Reddit, then actually people will see a lot more ideas and they can share their feelings. So for example, in a time zone case, we invited the two sides into a face-to-face -face facilitated meeting. And we asked them, why are you proposing this? What are your feelings? And finally, uh, this side said, I want Taiwan to be seen more unique in the world. And this side is like, why would it make Taiwan more unique? There's many other countries with plus nine as its time zone. And this side said, well, at least more unique from visitors from Beijing or Shanghai because they have to change their watch uh, into a different time zone. And this side is like, OK, I actually agree with this feeling, but I don't agree with your idea. Because first, it's all smartwatch and uh, smartphones now. They can change their time zone automatically. So it's not a very good reminder. <laughs> and the second thing is that you know um, the PRC can just say, you know, mm, Hong Kong has its own currency. Many large countries have many time zones. So it's not a very good symbolic gesture either. So instead of paying so much budget to change the time zone for everyone, why don't we use the same budget to do something that can make Taiwan more visible? So that both sides started agree on each other's feeling, but not ideas. And then they start brainstorming new ideas, innovations, such as letting more people understand how we get to marriage equality, the history of Taiwan's human rights, of social movements, of the government, actually our contribution to sustainable development goals, and so on. And so they all agree it's a better way to spend our budget. So it seems that they're proposing, but that's only at ideas level. If we get into the feeling level, people actually have the same values.
the reason why we work so well with the parliament is that in Taiwan, most draft bills, draft act, are written by the administration and sent to the parliament for debate. In other countries, it may be the parties that write the uh, draft acts. In Taiwan, also some parties do write their version, but they are mostly based on the administration's version. And so, because of this, the drafting stage is actually in the administration, and the deliberation stage is in the parliament. The parliament can talk about how to fit the bill better with the society, how to allocate sufficient budget to support this bill, and so on. But the idea of having this bill in the first place is usually the majority of time from the ministries, from the administration. So it's already <coughs> defined like this in our law and constitution. So naturally, there is one part, like in design thinking, they use two diamonds. The first diamond is asking the right question. And the second diamond is solving it in the right way. And these two are different. So the administration using, uh, as you said, uh, digital democracy, we can get everybody's feelings and ideas about what's wrong with the society, of how can we do better, and that's the diverging part. And then using facilitation, we can get people into the same feeling with each other and converge on a common problem to solve. So how might we solve this thing together? But we don't move to implementation. We send this to the parliament. So the parliament can still debate how best to implement it. But they don't have to start from scratch. They have a higher quality bill. Previously, they only have a draft bill from the administration with some reason and rationale. But using open government, once they receive this draft bill, they can refer to the entirety of discussions that led to this draft bill. So the communication overhead is much lessened. If they want to run their public hearing, they know exactly who to invite. And if they run a public hearing, our office have also helped MPs, members of the parliament, to run public hearings in a collaborative way. And so this methodology carries all over into their work, but then they pick up the work. It's like passing the baton to the MPs. So because of this, it increased their efficiency and it makes their work more effective and more relevant to the public. And so that's why uh, all the parties in Taiwan endorse and support the open government platform. I'm very simple. I didn't understand the word administration. Administration. Ah, ah administration. administration. Ah, okay. And the executive branch. Sure. Uh -huh. yes, yes. Where we go to civic hacking. Uh, 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 so for many people, if it's a cybersecurity system and you immerse yourself in it, then of course you can become a cybersecurity hacker. Uh, there are people who wear the hat of black, meaning that they innovate for their personal benefit. Or they can wear the hat of white, a white hat security hacker, means that they report what they find in the system's flaw to the system operator, so we can all have a stronger cybersecurity defense. But a civic hacker is not a white hat or a, hat, a black hat hacker because we immerse ourselves into the system of society, of democracy, of governance. So it's not about standard security, but rather it's about a system that connects the society together to make decisions together. So anyone who understands sufficiently about the current decision-making ways and innovate new ways to make collective decisions and actions together that's the same thing. That's not just about programming or co coding. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, uh, the programming is programming. Uh, 
So I first started programming uh, in 1989 when I was eight years old. And my first program uh, inside, uh, well, my first program is actually Hello World, uh, mm -hmm. like everybody else. <laughs> but, but I wrote it on, uh, with pencil uh, on a paper because I did not have computers back then, so I just wrote it on paper. But my first real program on a real computer um, is uh, teaching mathematics. So earlier this morning, I talked with a senior high school uh, entrepreneur teacher. Uh, he was teaching mathematics. And so we were uh, having a lot of fun discussing different ways to make mathematics more interesting. Right? And so uh, my first program is a uh, number line starting from zero to one. And you can see some balloons on it. And you can press you know, uh, one slash two, meaning uh, one half and you can see a point in one half. And if it reaches the balloon, then it explodes and you win some score. But if it misses, then you may say, oh, three slash five, or something like that. And you can move, right? And so this uh, teach the idea of fractional in a very interactive way uh, to young children. Right? So that's my first program. Uh, to me, it's always interactive. Programming always have a person, a human in mind of the music of the system. And so it's like a um, writing music. Uh, and the notes, the musical notes, is logic, right? building logic, or functional logic, objective-oriented logic. The logic are the notes, but when we play it, it's like playing the piano, performing the music. And the melody is the interaction that it enabled between people. Uh, you said radical transparency. Yes. Why is it so important? You found it earlier, your early your age. Mm -hmm. Your earlier age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So radical transparency meaning transparency at the root. Radical meaning at the root. Right? So usually in most countries that have a freedom of information law, transparency is only required after the government makes the decision. But before the government makes decisions, when we're just discussing, so-called the drafting stage, is usually not transparent. Because we want to protect the public service so that they can entertain different options and ideas without getting you know, uh, accused of uh, thinking bad ideas. You have to give them room to experiment. But my idea, very simply, is that because my mandate is to make even the failed ideas into the commons so that people can learn that the government have considered those ideas and they don't quite work, like change the time zone. And, but why it doesn't work, that also need to be transparent. And so by transparency at the root, I mean we make things transparent at the very beginning when the government still have no idea, when it's just a petition. When we first learn of this thing, then we start making the process transparent. But it doesn't mean like we're live streaming the video because it's an invasion on you know, privacy. So we usually make things public as a transcript so that people can edit after 10 days and then the version that people are comfortable with, uh, taking out the jokes that nobody understands uh, except in context, taking out those things. And if we mention anecdotes like other people's stories, they have not authorized us to mention the story in the public. And so we also take those confidential parts out. But otherwise, we publish everything to the general public. And this is very important because it enables people to understand the why of policy making, not just the what of the policies. You, uh, you, you said several times repeatedly open data and open source. Yes. And you said that uh, you mean open data, but not but Price, privacy keeping data. Privacy keeping data. Yeah, uh, uh, data. Uh, yeah. Open data, open data, open source is a very important thing. You guys have said that. But then, you know, I said, you know, data open data. Open data is a very important thing. This is a very important thing. 在数位民主主义里面，资料的一些它的重要性是什么？它什么样的存在？可能不能这么说。What should data be？ 因为
So open data means data that, that has no privacy concern, like the existence of the mountain hikes, the hiking trails we just talked about this morning, or the current temperature, the current air quality, uh, water quality. All this has nothing to do with privacy, as so it should be in the commons. It's like a map for everybody to see. And having it available as a printed map means that only people who are comfortable with map can read it. But if you publish it as data, what we call geospatial data or GIS data, then people who prefer to read can use a program to translate this into textual form. People who prefer to uh, interact as formulas, as interactive models, they can incorporate this into an interactive VR experience. People who prefer to understand this more from a uh, like space design perspective can even project a virtual M1 to this room and have people to uh, have Lego blocks or whatever to tactile uh, feedback on their supposed plans to build uh, communities and planning. So if you only publish the printed two-dimensional map, none of this new mode will be possible. So data, meaning machine-readable data, frees the data from the presentation. The presentation, like a paper, a PowerPoint slide, or something that is only human-readable, makes it possible for human to understand but it's always just a part of the entire humanity. Many people want to consume it in a different language. Many people from a different coordinate system. Maybe they want to change kilometers to miles. But without the data, none of this is possible. You're stuck with a paper map. So uh, in 2012, uh, my friends, it's not myself, uh, I was not part of the zero in the very beginning, uh, they saw an advertisement. The government says we have an economic power up plan and it's very complex. So they filmed a YouTube uh, video uh, showing ordinary citizens looking very confused and they uh, look up and a lot of budget name appears and they're like, oh, how can we make sense of this? And a voice says, you don't have to make sense of this. This is very complicated. Leave it to the government. You don't have to debate it. You can just work on it. So everybody just follow the economic power supply. It's the first YouTube video sponsored by the government to be flagged as spam and taken out of YouTube because people protested <laughs> that this is not democracy, this is uh, authoritarianism, right? Um, and so people really dislike this uh, advertisement. So a few friends of mine, they joined a hackathon run by Yahoo Taiwan, uh, and they wrote a budget visualization platform to make sure that the 500 page of national budget can be understood by anyone and have a real-time conversation about whether you like or dislike any particular budget item. Their idea is actually now part of the national registration platform. Uh, so after I become additional minister, I made sure that this is now maintained by the government, just like the winner of presidential hackathon. The social innovation becomes part of public service. So that's the origin of that. I joined in 2013. Uh, we don't say Jiaxinwen or fake news here because Xinwen here means both news but also journalism. So when we say fake news, we're also saying fake journalism. 
but that is attacking journalists. The best solution to uh, disinformation is publicly trustworthy journalism. Exactly the work you're doing, right? <laughs> so we cannot use the same word to offend journalists. It just doesn't work. So here we say disinformation. So information that is untrue, that are intentional, and they do harm to the public. And, and that is the issue that we're tackling now. Now, in Taiwan, we use three different layers uh, as defense. The first is that whenever a disinformation appears on social media, within 60 minutes, the responsible ministry will publish a work that is mimetic, means that it goes viral. It may be a joke, it may be a remixing of a comic book or whatever. It will be very funny. And the very funny uh, meme is clarifying this rumor, but not attacking anybody. Because research shows if you only say that this is not true, then people who already believe this feel as if you're attacking them. And so they reinforce their belief. That if you just make it really funny, then people will understand that, oh, things like this, uh, they can be humorous about it. And because it's viral and fast enough, we make sure that this message spread to more people before this disinformation does. So by the time that this information reaches people, they are already inoculated. Their mind already is protected against the feeling of outrage provoked by the disinformation. Because disinformation works by getting people to feel angry, so much so that they want to share the message. But if you're already inoculated, then you will feel very calm. And if you feel very calm, then it's just like if you vaccinated against the flu, then if people are coughing, <coughs> and then you get infected, you're immunized. So you will not spread to more people. And so that is our first line of defense. Right? That, that, that 60 million means. Uh, and, yes. the second? and the second is that we work with uh, LINE, which is an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging system, and also with Facebook, also Google, also uh, PTT, which is a uh, local Reddit platform. They all agreed on a self-regulation to come to this information. And by that, they may they allow the users to flag messages as rumors. It's just like email providers, when junk mail spam became a really big problem about 20 years ago. Everybody agreed to have a flag as spam button to your Gmail, to your uh, Hotmail, or other thing. If you receive something that says, I'm a royalty in a foreign country, I have $10 million for you, if you only pay $1,000 transaction fee in your account, uh, you know, things like that. And of course, it's not a personal message, right? It's just a scam. So email, although it's designed as private communication, and the government should never look into people's emails, we can ask people to donate the emails that are not meant for them anyway, so if they flag something as spam, they donate it into an international organization called uh, Spam House. And Spam House will tell all the email providers if the same person sends another batch of email. Don't let them go to the inbox. Let them go to the spam mail, junk mail folder. So it's not really censorship, right? It's still delivered, but it don't waste people's time. So the same with this information. On social media or online, when people see something that are not meant for them, but really a scam, they can flag it and send to the international network called the International Fact Checking Network, or IFCN. And the IFCN people will flag something after investigating it as true or as not true. If it's flagged as not true with the entire investigation published, Facebook, as well as other platforms, agree to make sure if your friend shared that again, it will not show up on your wall. It will show some other friend's message. But it's not taking it down. If you go to that friend's wall, you can still see that. But they will show a related link to the fact-checking report. And so it makes those, this information less viral. 
it will touch less than one fifth of the original people. Whereas the clarification, because it's a mimetic, it gets more viral. So making truth, or at least our version, our part of the worldview, more viral, and making sure that intentional harmful message gets not viral, like spam. We want our email to deliver, but we don't want junk mail to populate people's attention. So that is the second line of defense by the global platforms. And the third thing is that, especially during election, there are disinformation that are weaponized, meaning that people spend a lot of money using precision targeting, just want to sow discord in a certain population. We have seen how, for example, in the US, uh, people from Russia have operated this kind of campaign in the United States election. And so in Taiwan, we're adopting what we call the Honest Advertisement Act from the US. So it will be passed, I think, later this year by the parliament, essentially saying if you place a political advertisement, you have to disclose yourself, your registration number of the company, uh, your uh, bank, or things like that. And you have to review the criteria of your position on the bank. And then you have to disclose, as required by the law, who is paying for it. And just like anti-money laundering, this person must also review who is paying for it who is paying for it, until we get the ultimate source of funding. And if they are a Taiwanese citizen, of course it's legal, and we just treat it like an Indian nation. In Taiwan today, we have published all the donation report for the previous election, down to the name and individual number of donations. So it is very transparent, one of the most transparent in the world. So the next election, we're giving this treatment also to political evidence. And if the people paying for it are not Taiwanese citizens, then actually it's a, a violation of the law. Just like in Indonesia, you're not supposed to donate to uh, an election that you're, you cannot vote. Uh, so if it's uh, extrajudicial, if it's from a foreign source, then the person who contact them will be fined for up to 50 million dollars. And so that's how we're making the political advertisement transparent. That's the third one. They actually, uh, actually detected many cases? Yes. So if you go to the I, uh, Taiwan Fact Check Center, TFCC, you will see all the cases that are uh, checked by professional journalists. Can you please? Give me one minute, because I want to check if you need some questions. Of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. Of uh, the elections. 
uh, but the law is passed by the legislative, but the law is draft is published by the administration. So it's three branches working together. And what just happened yesterday is that the control UN published not only as online website, but also as open data, all the campaign donation report of the previous election. So in the old system that are very stable, the government usually sees itself as the organizer of people's voice. So you have the county leaders, the mayors of counties and cities, organizing the people in the vicinity. And then you have the national administration uh, in different ministries organizing people who are concerned about economy, about uh, welfare, about environment, and so on. And again, in the legislative branch, you have committees each talking about one particular concern. Right? So they all serve as essentially organizers of people's voices as the first function. The second is an arbitrating function. So as an arbiter, like if economic development is important, but environmental sustainability is also important, the government is charged to make a balance between the two concerns. Innovation is very important, technology and science, but social justice, equality is also very important, but they may you know, counteract each other. So again, government is making this trade-off. So organization and making trade-off, these are two traditional roles the government. Now the problem becomes, whenever a social innovation comes, if it uh, makes a large impact, like social media, like self-driving vehicles, uh, as small as platform economy, sharing economy, or e-scooters, right? All the different uh, ideas of long distance education, long distance uh, therapy, long distance diagnosis, and so on. All these are innovations that have no counterparts. I just talked about e-sport. E-sport has no counterpart in the agency system of the national government. And so the quicker the innovation are, the more difficult for existing organization and trading off system to catch up with the innovation. And so when things change this fast, the government need to understand that people don't need a mayor or a counselor to organize anymore. With a hashtag, people can organize very quickly. So because of this, when you see hashtag change Taiwan's time zone, you don't make a new agency <laughs> to address this issue. Uh, of course, you can reimagine yourself. And so the public service must become a new uh, way of collaborating of the uh, different sector, what we call co-gov, of collaborative governance. So COGA means, instead of saying, who are the organizers? Who make trade-offs? We're asking, who are the people with different positions? The stakeholders. And given different positions, is it possible that they have common feelings? That they have common values? That's the first question to ask. So it's a space where people can discover each other's feelings. And the next question is, once we have some common values that we want to, the world to see Taiwan as more unique, that's a common value. Can anyone make innovation that makes this happen without sacrificing anyone? So by repeatedly asking those two questions, we become a platform on which collaboration can happen. Because we let go 
of the organizational power. We admit with the new hashtag, anyone can be an organizer. And also, it's not about making trade-off, because a short-term trade-off can just misfire when a new hashtag, a new innovation comes. It's much more important to have common values. And that is why we use the 17 values, the sustainable development goals, as a common index, an international index, that about how to address poverty, to make everybody healthy and have uh, well-being, uh, of uh, having a very good education, uh, and so on. So solving uh, poverty and hunger, and then uh, having good education and uh, well-being. Those four are basic values everybody can agree. And all the way to the last few values, such as addressing climate change, uh, such as making sure uh, this is actually the open government color, uh, meaning that uh, the decision-making is fair and inclusive. And finally, that internationally, people work on the common values. And so starting from the very basic, all the way to the truly international, these are the common values we're trying to make everybody state their position in terms of these values, so we can collaboratively find new ways together that involve contribution from all sectors, not just a few members of the council or members of the community. I just got to understand why people call you an idealist. So many people say that you are an idealist, right? That's mm -hmm. <laughs> a part of your idea, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, I'm a practicing theorist. So it's not just idea because, as you can see, I put it into action every day. But at the end of the day, of course, I absorb those uh, learnings and into new ideas. Uh, this is my hobby. I, I joined the government for fun. When, when the premier asked me, uh, am I here to realize some personal goal or to have some mission or have some duty or have some loyalty to the country or whatever is my motivation, I'm like, no, I'm doing this for fun. So I'm already retired well before joining the cabinet. And so this is basically just because I like talking to people. And I like making sure that people can interact in a way that are collaborative. So because it's my hobby, digital minister or not, I'm doing exactly the same thing. Before I joined the cabinet, advising the previous uh, minister's time, I'm also doing the same thing. It's exactly the same thing that I'm doing. And so basically, wherever I am, I'm just making sure that the people can work across sectors. A Lagrange point between us and the moon doesn't belong to the Earth or the moon, right? So I'm continuously making change in this moment. You, I, I understand. You said that you are doing so many things fun, and you think fun, and you are doing. 아주 많은 일을 하고 계신데 그렇다면 what can ordinary people do? What should they do? Not you. This is literally the UNDP back in 2014. Ask a million people on the planet, what do you want to see in the year 2030? What kind of future do you want? And they publish a report uh, called A Million Voices. And that includes the ideas and feelings of more than one million people on Earth. And they collected those thoughts together in a way that reinforced instead of uh, fighting each other as the 17 development goals. And so learning about those 17 goals is learning the collective will of the entire Earth population. And 
after understanding it, I'm sure that you can find something that you can personally do to help our one of the seven causes. And you can be rest assured that whichever one you work on, it will only support the other 16. Next question is, what will be the future of democracy? Mm -hmm. Yes, so I think democracy, like authoritarianism, can be amplified by digital technology. So if you have a government committed to trust the people, digital technology can help you trust the people more and trust more people. And if you have a government that is built on distrusting the people, on not trusting the people, then the digital technology can also help you distrust people even more and have people uh, survey each other and report each other and build a large social credit system out of those surveillance uh, data. And so digital technology is never neutral. It starts from a trust or distrust. If you are an operator and you don't trust your users, of course you want to control them. But if you are an open source movement practitioner and you trust your neighbors to make something better, like Wikipedia, then of course you will build technology that makes trust even more possible and across more ethnicities, cultures, genders, and so on. And so just ask yourself whether you want to trust your fellow citizens more or less. If it's more, then democracy's future is firmly in your hands. You can participate in making it. And if you don't trust your fellow citizens, then of course digital technology can also help to make the world a prison, uh, and both are possible. Thank you, Mr. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, it was so much. It was a pleasure to meet you, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.